Welcome to today's webinar, Great Partners and Creative Approaches to Promoting Safe Walk Opportunities, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in coordination with the Maryland Department of Transportation and our many Walktober partners. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and host of the Walktober Walk in our series. Walking is an activity that many of us take for granted, but as the pedestrian accident rates continue to rise and access to safe pedestrian spaces is diminished, communities are recognizing that walking and improving the walkability of our neighborhoods requires public attention and action. Throughout October, the Maryland Department of Transportation, in coordination with several state agencies and other partners, has been sponsoring a series of webinars or walk in ours to highlight how we can collectively rally around walking, an activity that is both central to the state's active transportation efforts and a critical component promoting public well being. This is the final in a four part series that we have hosted every Thursday this month. Thank you for joining us today and throughout the month. For more information about Walktober, please visit m.maryland.gov forward slash Walktober or visit smartgrowth.org and click on the Walktober Walk in Ours link. We are recording this webinar and we'll be posting it online. All participants today will re receive an email with a link to the recording once it is posted. The Maryland Department of Planning also hosts a national webinar series in association with the Smart Growth Network on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter for smart growth and planning news and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting, visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. The views expressed in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning, the Maryland Department of Transportation, or the state of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Great Partners and Creative Opportunities creative approaches for promoting safe walk opportunities. You can also search for event number 9224777. So to get started, our speakers today are Carrie Sorensen, Quentin Batts, Vildi Uslet, and Kenneth Swift. Carrie Sorensen is a family and consumer sciences educator with the University of Maryland Extension in Frederick County. As an FCS educator, she is responsible for, for, for providing community education in the Frederick area. She teaches a variety of classes covering financial literacy, healthy living, health insurance literacy, and wellness. Carrie has a bachelor's degree in sport and exercise psychology from West Virginia University and a master's in public health from George Washington University. Bildi Uslet and Quinton Batts are graduates of the Maryland Institute College of Arts Center for Social Design Masters of Arts program. Since 2018, they have collaborated with the Maryland Highway Safety Office, the Baltimore City DOT, and community partners to implement and evaluate pilot programs to increase pedestrian and bicycle safety under the Made You Look initiative that you can view on the web at madeyoulookbaltimore.org. Made You Look is a collaboration between MICA's Center for Social Design and the Maryland Department of Transportation Motor Vehicle Administration's Highway Safety Office to make Baltimore a safer place for pedestrians and bicyclists by increasing visibility on two levels. One, raising the visibility of individuals walking or biking in the city, and two, making local safety concerns visible to policymakers. Finally, Kenneth Swift leads the Washington, D.C. office of the Sherry Matthews Group, where she serves as the go-to expert for transportation or traffic safety and transportation issues in the Northeast region. She has worked in the Mid-Atlantic for more than 10 years and has more than 15 years of experience managing integrated multimedia campaigns. Kenna has managed projects for clients focused on transportation, including the District Department of Transportation's Truck Safety Outreach Initiative, Montgomery County DOT's Safe Routes to School campaign, and the Southern California Association of Governments Go Human Active Transportation Campaign. Kenna leads the team that developed the Baltimore Metropolitan Council's Look Alive Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety Campaign that she'll be talking about today. Following their presentations, our panelists will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool located on the, in the control panel on the right side of your screen. 
And before we get started, as we have been doing all month, we'd like to share a brief video from MDOT Secretary Greg Slater introducing today's Walktober Walk in Our program. Thank you, Greg, and thanks to the MDOT folks who helped to coordinate the videos this time. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. Welcome, Carrie. Okay, put it in full screen mode, Carrie, if you can, and you'll need to unmute. All right, sorry about that. It was telling me I didn't have the right plugin and I was like, oh no. <laughs> um, okay, but I think we're all good to go now. Hopefully you guys can see. And uh, I am really excited to be here with you today and tell you a little bit about um, our Story Path initiative. Um, and this was a great introduction, so um, I'll, I'll dive right in. My name is Carrie Sorensen and I'm a community educator with University of Maryland Extension in Frederick County. Um, just for a little bit of background, University of Maryland Extension is the outreach arm for the University of Maryland. And so we're really responsible for taking the wonderful things that are going on on campus, all the excellent research that they do, and turning that into quality evidence-based education that we can provide to people across the state. Um, and so, like was mentioned earlier, I teach a lot of different things, <laughs> financial literacy, healthy living, how to eat healthy on a budget, how to understand your health insurance plan, um, things about physical activity, and so much more. And I would encourage each of you that if you are not connected with the extension office in your area, um, reach out to them. They have a ton of really wonderful services that they offer. There will likely be someone like me who teaches health and finance and that kind of thing, but we also have really great um, master gardener programs. The 4-H program is an extension program. We have um, supports for farmers and the agricultural community. So there is a ton of really wonderful stuff going on at Extension, and I would really encourage you to check it out. Um, like I mentioned, there's an Extension office in every county in Baltimore City in Maryland. So more than likely you have one of us uh, nearby. I will also mention in case we have anyone from outside the state of Maryland that um, the extension system while in Maryland, it's University of Maryland Extension and University of Maryland Eastern Shore, um, the extension system is one that's actually a national um, set of setup. So if you are from another state, you still have extension and it's connected to whatever the major land grant university is in your state. Um, so for Pennsylvania, it's Penn State. For West Virginia, it's WVU. Um, for other states like Texas, it's Texas A&M. So put in your state plus extension and you will find extension services uh, near you that have a lot, ton of wonderful opportunities. 
All right, so now that I've kind of given you that little bit, I'm, I'll kind of backtrack here and tell you a little bit about StoryPath. So I'm gonna show you some pictures and things, but I wanna kind of give you the overview first. It was originally created by a, per, a woman named Ann Ferguson. So I cannot take the credit for this original idea of how this works, what the setup is like, but I can tell you a little bit about what it was like for us to implement it um, and how we went about doing that. But I wanna be very clear that Ann Ferguson is the lovely person who originated this idea. If you go to the website that's there, you can see a little bit more about how that came into being, uh, but it is a publicly available idea. So while I wanna definitely give her credit, they have been very clear about that all communities should um, put their own spin on it and figure out how this works best for you. So this is kind of a basic overview of how it works. You take a book, usually a children's book, I would say it's probably a younger children's book, you'll see that as we move more along, and it actually you kind of, <laughs> for, for my book lovers out there, I'm very sorry, you, you take the pages out of it, it's done very respectfully, I promise. Uh, <laughs> so you take the pages out of it and you actually mount them on signs and then place them along a path, and so as people walk along the path, they get to read the book, and so the pages go in order, and as you walk from sign to sign, you get to read the book. Um, there have been programs like StoryPath in all 50 states, um, in countries like Germany, Canada, England, Pakistan, so many more. Um, and I will also say, the, they refer to them, usually they're called Story Walk. We called it Story Path because we wanted to be very clear that um, regardless of whether or not you were someone who walks in a traditional fashion, this was still something that is open to you. Um, and you'll kind of see that more as we go along too. So what makes our kind of approach to it unique and why we want to share this with you today is that really for our story path, we took a, a team coalition approach. So um, I think I get to talk about a little, this a little bit later, but um, I sort of found out about this through my extension connections and then ended up being connected with Live Well Frederick and thought, oh my gosh, this would be a great opportunity for us to work together. Um, so Live Well Frederick takes part in the 5210 program. And if you're familiar with that, you know that it's, it's four things that especially kids can do to improve health. So it's five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, um, two hours of physical activity, less than an hour of screen time and zero sugar sweetened beverages. So that's kind of the idea behind it. And what, the reason that we thought StoryPath would be a great fit as, as an initiative under Live Well Frederick is because it involves physical activity, but it also involves getting outside and spending less time in front of screens. So um, we thought this would be really wonderful. It's also, it ended up being a really great way for Extension, Live Well Frederick, some of the other community partners to get out in the community, get people familiar with us, our organization, what we do, um, and really kind of get some awareness and recognition in the community of who we are and the services that we offer. Okay, so who are the partners? I'm talking about this partnership approach. Um, so Frederick Health is the uh, major healthcare system in our area and they operate a lot of different specialty care providers, urgent care, a ton more than that. Um, and then so under their sort of initiative, they had some funding available, they were supporting the Live Well Frederick Initiative, which is a partnership of businesses, faith-based groups, educators, community groups. Um, and the, the goal of that is to provide resources and events and opportunities for people in the Frederick County area to improve their health. Myself with the University of Maryland Extension, we worked with the folks from um, Frederick County Parks and Rec who were wonderful, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, and the Frederick County Public Libraries, who again, were lovely, and then Graphcom, who had been working with Frederick Health on some of their marketing initiatives, was able to work with us under Live Well Frederick to provide us with some really lovely uh, marketing and design for this to make it a really um, sustainable, you know, something that was gonna look nice. Um, if you've seen some of these before, sometimes they are on like uh, step stake, like if you can picture maybe like a um, campaign sign where they kind of float about in the wind. I'm going to show you our signs in just a second, and that is all Graphcom. They were able to help us make sure that this looked really, really nice. Uh, and so these were our partners, and I can say with absolute certainty that we would not have been able to do this without any single one of these folks. Um, 
each group that was involved in this was hugely important. So being able to have a, a coalition in the area like Live Well Frederick meant that I could just go to them and say, hey, I think this might be something that would be good for the community. And then they were able to pull together a meeting, already have the contacts and the members. Uh, and so being able to connect with them was just hugely helpful um, in getting everyone together and getting this off the ground. So how did we actually get up and running? Uh, I reached out to Live Well Frederick after seeing Kansas State talk about a story path presentation. I thought it would be really cool. And also the nice thing about story path is that it can be really tailored to everyone's kind of individual approach to it. So uh, we took a, an approach where we were making sure that all the books we picked had health related messages. They um, I kind of have a spectrum of things that they talk about, but they were very focused on healthy living or trying new foods or some of these different things. Uh, and so we thought this would be a really great opportunity. The one that Kansas State did, they actually did um, with books about money. So they were taking more of a financial literacy approach. But again, it's very customizable. Uh, and so if you were looking to do something like this, you could take books and use books that are a good fit for your program or initiative. Um, so we had initial meetings. We talked with different people to see who might be interested, who could participate, who could offer support. Um, luckily, our wonderful partner organizations were able to offer funding for getting the materials together, uh, personnel, our our graphic design folks uh, and more and so we pulled together enough people and we got enough commitments that we we felt like okay we have enough support that we can move forward with this and we can start planning more specifics okay so the next step after getting all of that engagement and making sure that we were all on the same page the next step was to pick out books and so we have a wonderful children's librarian through um, frederick county County Public Libraries, and they were able to help us identify potential books with themes around healthy eating. Um, and so we also put, it was very important to us to make sure that the books that we were using were going to represent the potential, the kids and people who might be using this story path in Frederick County. Um, and it can be difficult to find children's books that have a diverse set of characters in them. Um, and so we were really, really grateful to the public library folks for pointing us in the right direction and making sure that we were gonna be um, offering examples to kids of someone who looked like them or felt like them that you know it was kind of like, well, if this book character can do these things then maybe I can too. Um, and so you can see some of our books across the bottom, Giraffes Can't Dance, I Got the Rhythm, Rainbow Stew, uh, I Will Never Not Ever Eat a Tomato, and My Colors, My World. Um, which is also in Spanish on side by side. It's available in Spanish and English in the same um, book. So those were some of the books we have. We also have From Head to Toe, which is an Eric Carle book. Um, we have, uh, let's see, no, there's one I can think of right now that I'm not thinking of. But anyway, we have a, a bunch of different books, but they have very similar themes around gardening or eating fruits and vegetables or movement or trying new things. And so that was really important to us. All right, so the next step was to get the materials. We had our books picked out, and so now we needed to actually turn them into the pages. <laughs> so you can see in the pictures here how it actually came out. This is it from an event that we did actually with Frederick County um, Parks and Rec. So they have their annual Easter egg, Easter egg, uh, I think it's called Easter egg roll, but it's at a park in Frederick County. And so we have these wonderful walking paths and to encourage people to walk on the paths and to go to different areas or to kind of um, encourage them to flow in a certain direction, we put the signs up so that people would start at the first page, which was kind of as they came in from the parking lot and then they can follow the signs as they go along. We're also very careful about like from each sign, you can clearly see the next sign. So they're not numbered or anything, but you can clearly tell like where the start is and where the finish is. And uh, Graphcom was wonderful. They were the main folks who helped us figure all this out. Uh, so we have these metal signs and the pages are actually laminated onto an insert that slides into the signs. So we have two sets of signs. We can have two books up at the same time and then they, the pages can just change out. And then the bottom banner has contact information for if there's an issue with the story path. And then it also has our two logos on it. Um, and so it was really, really wonderful branding and design 
uh, and it went uh, just really, really well. We are very appreciative of them. Another key partner was Frederick County Parks and Rec. Uh, they helped us identify parks. As I mentioned before, we wanted to make sure that everyone could participate. So we have been exclusively setting up the signs along uh, paved pathways that are ADA compliant so that anyone can access these pages and these signs. That's been something we're trying really hard to make sure we're paying attention to, um, to really encourage everyone that everyone moves in different ways. And so you can participate in the story path regardless. So they were really, really wonderful. They helped us identify which parks would be good candidates. Um, they considered things that I would have never considered wind level in the different parks and some of the things. So they were wonderful. Uh, and then our, our shining stars are the parks maintenance employees who were hugely helpful. Uh, they weed walked around the signs, reinstalled them if they fell down. We did have our pages are kind of a chloroplast, so they bend a little bit. And so we did have some blow away in bad weather. Uh, and they were really wonderful about chasing them down for us and putting them back as best they could, um, which was great. And we didn't really have many issues with theft or vandalism of the signs. Like I said, we had some weather issues. We had um, essentially like a tornado go through one of the parks that it was displayed in. And I think we lost like over half of the book that was being shown at the time. The nice thing is the signs themselves, the metal signs, we didn't lose any of those. So it was fairly inexpensive to um, have the individual insert pages be replaced. All right, so how did it go? Um, we're actually getting ready to wrap up our third year. We have received so much positive feedback from the community. Every time, so I'm actually the person who goes out and changes the path. So I go out with my mallet and I put new signs in the ground and uh, I take the pages out and put new ones in. And every time I'm out in a park changing the signs, um, there will be a parent or someone nearby who says, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. There's a new book. I've been waiting. Usually they display for like a week or two. Um, and so we get a ton of positive feedback. We've gotten emails from people with how much they appreciate it. Our first, there's an introductory page that I didn't show you, but like their first sign is sort of a larger welcome to the story path sign. And it has a QR code on it that takes you to the Live Well website. And we've had really great website engagement from that. Um, so overall, very positive. Our, so our website's been viewed by about 400 times at the time when we put this together. Um, they, people are actually spending time on the page and looking around. Social media, we are on Instagram and Twitter. We've gotten connected with um, the Frederick County teachers and so like if there's a librarian in a county where there's a story path then they will usually like retweet us and um, people will share the information around so it's been really well received um, especially considering that live well is is a fairly new organization so it's getting a lot of traction for something that hasn't been around for a long time and so a couple of things to keep in mind if you would like to do something similar for, um, for us this was a really really great initiative it's a it's a creative way to get out a little bit about what LiveWell is doing, what Extension is doing. Um, it's you know something fun for people in the community to do, but there are some things you wanna keep in mind. Um, who's gonna provide the materials? There are a ton of different cost levels. If you go on the Kellogg website or this look up different story paths or story walks, you'll see um, it, it ranges anything from like the step stake signs that you put in the ground to like some places will have uh, like concrete posts or wooden posts that they've put in the ground with concrete to display the pages of the story path along some kind of walking trail. So there's a huge range, but just figuring out what's, your, what's kind of your budget and who could provide the materials, um, who's gonna be able to set up and take down the signs. I will say, since this is my main responsibility, it is not a small time commitment through the summer. So it does take a little bit of time to set up and take down, especially depending on what kind of materials you get. So you wanna make sure you have someone who uh, understands that. And especially if you're using like property that doesn't, isn't one that you regularly maintain. So like for us, um, it's the Frederick County Parks folks who we were using their land. So we really had to be sure we're communicating with the maintenance personnel um, and that they are on board with the, with the program because we're asking a lot 
from them. And so making sure that they are uh, on board with that and know what's being asked of them is really important. And then just, it's a lot of materials. So in the off season, when it's cold outside, where are you gonna store the materials? They all live in my office. Luckily I have a little bit of extra space, um, but <laughs> you gotta make sure you know where those things are, are gonna be going. And uh, my contact information is here. If you have any questions about it or if you have you know, specific things you'd like to ask me about, I just wanna say again, thank you so much for having me here today. I really enjoyed getting to tell you a little bit about this program um, and it's you know, near and dear to my heart. I've really enjoyed being part of it. So with that, I am going to turn things over to Vilde and Quinton so they can tell you a little bit about their initiative. Thank you, Carrie. So we're going to pivot from Frederick County to Baltimore City. Um, and we're also very excited to be here and to present to you all our, uh, the title of our presentation is Equipping Communities with Human-Centered Design Tools for Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety. We're based out of uh, MICA Center for Social Design and um, our presentation is Threefolded. So we will start by kind of showing how we did the use the human-centered design process to come up um, with our uh, pilots, and then we'll show you our uh, interventions for pet and bike safety in Baltimore City. And then lastly, we'll talk shortly about uh, year four uh, accessibility, sustainability, and evaluation. So this is just an overview of. The major look project we started back in 2018 with understanding the problem uh, framing the or talking to community members and then really framing framing the problem and honing in now year two we um, did pilot implementations year three was about democratizing the process and then uh, right now year four is about making the process accessible and, and the older initiatives can have a home and be sustainable and last into the future. So uh, going straight into it, uh, phase one, um, we started by understanding why are we focusing on uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety in Baltimore City? And we got these data um, that are still, th these are numbers from 2018, but, but the numbers are still, still the, about the same average every year. So in 2018, there was one crash every 30 minutes, one traffic-related injury every hour, and one traffic-related fatality every week. And then we also know that pedestrians and cyclists represent over 20% of the fatal traffic crashes in the state of Maryland. Um, furthermore, the, um, we also learned that one third of the pedestrian injuries that happen are um, people under 19 years old being being hurt or being involved in this accident. So this became really important for us um, moving forward, really incorporating the youth perspective, youth voices, but also interventions that could focus on keeping our kids safe while they're walking, walking or biking on the street. Um, this is the Project area for the first year, the MICA main campus is in the center. To the north is North Avenue, and to the south is Dolphin Street, and then Utah Place um, and Calvert Street to the east and west. But, um, so this is the immediate neighborhood uh, kind of surrounding the MICA's campus. And these circles represent the, air, the crashes um, that are occurred, and the red, red areas are where there have been the um, fatalities, pedestrian or bicycle uh, fatalities in this area. Um, Human-centered design is really about understanding the user perspective and the user or 
the lived experience of something. So uh, what we did was to talk to as many different stakeholders as possible, kind of all levels of the city from the people, pedestrians and bikers, um, pedestrian and bicyclist av advocacy groups, but also kind of city, city stakeholders, so engineers, um, city planners, etc. So as as wide range of different perspectives as, as possible. Uh, some of the things that we heard uh, while talking to people was in an ideal world there will be a magic fund that installed lighting throughout the city because kids stay out late riding their bicycles and my biggest concern for them is their visibility. And this was from a non-profit or youth organ organization like director of a youth program in the city. Um, Baltimore roads are built to prioritize the movement of cars to and from the county. And lastly, conflict happens when a pedestrian is some, somewhere a driver doesn't expect. So uh, taking all the information um, that we had gathered, we, we formed these four insights uh, to really focus on where we could make um, a positive change or make a change to this. So rule breaking is often required to effectively cross the street because the streets are designed for cars, not pedestrians. Um, infrastructure does not support clear visibility. And this is especially true around schools. So um, dismissal or drop off and pick up um, at schools are um, usually a big problem <laughs> because there is cars going on. Yeah not clear visibility around the school zones. Uh, insight number three, um, by prioritizing those who drive in and out of the county, the city creates less safe environments for locals who often do not have cars. And then lastly, um, people really want to make changes and improve uh, pedestrian and bike safety in their neighborhoods, but they don't really feel that they have the agency to do it or that their voices are being heard. And then kind of, so that was the research part very, very quickly. It took us much longer than, or it took us at least six months to kind of arrive at these insights. But then we gathered all the, all the partners, all the people we had talked to, all the uh, people we had interviewed and interacted with back into the studio and then uh, invited everybody to be part of um, brainstorming possible kind of intervention projects with us. And out of that process came the major local initiative. So the, it's really focused on how, how to ensure, how might we ensure that pedestrians and bicyclists are seen and prioritized. And we're working on two levels. So making sure people are physically seen when they're walking and biking in the city, but also um, raising these safety concerns to the policymakers in the city. And uh, we defined the term road equity. And for us, that is to kind of equal the, the power imbalance between drivers or cars and the other road users. So in this uh, picture, uh, Jasper, one of our partners, is demonstrating the route that ch school children have to take to kind of get to and from uh, the bus stop to and from school every day. And uh, basically having to ri risk their lives, cars go really fast down this road and school children have to risk their lives in order to cross the street uh, to get to the bus stop. So <laughs> road equity would mean having a safe crosswalk to be able to cross the street in this picture. Uh, we also uh, formulated these design principles. So we're working toward to promote mobility as a human right and advocate for road equity. We are working to inspire change by engaging community and uplifting, uplifting safety concerns. We want to prioritize cooperation and collaboration, and we want to work towards simple and sustainable solutions. Uh, and these were kind of these were the four initiatives that, that came out, the four main ideas that came out. So reflective gear, uh, making sure uh, people that are walking by the streets can be seen uh, and also in the dark. Um, bright lanes is about giving visual cues to drivers to make them more aware that they're in pedestrian heavy zones. So um, making this uh, traffic calming art or art crosswalks um, to kind of tell drivers that they have to slow down. 
And the underline is experimenting uh, also with visual cues, but using lights and see how to see how lights can work in the same way to kind of make drivers appear, uh, more aware of pedestrian heavy zones. And then lastly, the art in the right of way toolkit is a step by step DIY guide for community members that want to install their own uh, traffic calming initiatives. I'm going to hand it over to Q to talk about phase two. Oh, I don't think he can unmute, maybe. There, so phase two is about the pilot. I'm on my mute now, thank you. So um, phase two is about pilot implementation. This is where we were testing all of those pilots Villa just filled you in on. And as you can see in this map, we extended our, our original study area. The red dots, that was our original study area where it was made up of really a Bowden Hill station north in Utah place, but we know we needed to reach a bigger area. So for the year two, we expanded out the Reservoir Hill and it also started, uh, stretched further down um, East North Avenue to include uh, Johnson Square and all these other areas that's close to um, Station North. And then um, we added these community advisors onto the, to the uh, program to make sure that we were moving right in the community. And um, first we added Jasper Barnes, who is the director of Baltimore Youth Kinetic Energy. Uh, we added Graham Corral Allen, who, who was the owner of Graham Projects. We added Akia Jones, who was the owner of the Be More brand. And we added Michael Bowman, who is the owner of Formstone Castle, which you'll hear more about later. And we did a lot of community engagement, like Bill mentioned how we did in year one. We started off again in year two doing even more to see how we could tweak and make these pilots uh, useful in neighborhoods. And we started attending community events just to get the word out and talk to residents more. Uh, it was good to attach on to other events similar to ours that were focused around lighting and pedestrian uh, safety. And for our first pilot, um, it was reflective streetwear. This came from the idea of making clothing that was highly visible um, so that pedestrians could be seen while also giving them that road equity, making them equal users of the road. And we've piloted and tested a lot of ways how to make reflective clothing. As you can see, this first one is Safety City Day. And the second one is from one of our uh, many of uh, screen printing workshops where we have students come in and actually create their own reflective clothing. And then we had the opportunity to drop our official Made You Look Reflective T-shirt. And uh, these are, are made with the Be More brand and they are still available. Um, they're available on our Instagram and our website and we can link y'all more to that later. And they all, each one of them come with these reflective tags and they're detachable and they're also giving a lot of information on why these shirts were created and why you're buying them and what the, what the support goes to. And just here's some photos of furthermore collaborations with Reflect the Gear that came out of that. A lot of organizations have had bike rides and bike events. And we were able to make shirts for them to make them reflective and stand out where they're riding around the city. And then uh, moving over to the bright lanes. So as I mentioned, it's about creating visual cues for drivers to slow down and be, and be more aware of pedestrians and cyclists in these areas. Um, the first one we did was in Greenman West. Um, the community, uh, or we had asked for input on pedestrian and bike safety concerns in the community. And then together with the community organization, we prioritized kind of the locations uh, where they want, felt there were, the interventions were most needed. Um, so the pink dots here are the kind of priority areas for the community. But um, we decided to, to do our pilot implementation here in this um, crosswalk. This is right outside OpenWorks, which is a maker space in the city. Uh, this street is, also has many youth programs and uh, a high school. And then Greenmont Avenue, which uh, goes to the, to the right of the picture, is so it's an arterial road. Also, 
like so cars go really fast on that street and the community really felt like they needed a transition uh, from this high moving or very fast street to a very pedestrian heavy area right here and um, we had a lot of community design workshops asked what they would like to see or how they wanted the crosswalk to be um, and then this is the intervention that we did so this bump out was already here uh, and what we did was to install the flex post so that cars couldn't drive across it and then painted it uh, to make the visual impact uh, we also did evaluations, so we sent out a survey afterwards, and 25 out of 30 respondents said that it really made them feel safer as pedestrians um, in this area. And then they also said, so I certainly noticed my own behavior while driving through this in intersection has changed. So doing this makes, makes the drivers more aware and kind of adjusting their behavior. I'm just going to quickly uh, show another example from Reservoir Hill. They similarly did a mapping exercise and prioritized uh, in the community. They chose uh, Whitelock, this uh, area right here, which is the center of, there's many playgrounds, uh, there's a, a community farm and a huge park right here. So they felt like that was the area to focus on. And then this is the intersection before we did intervention. So and the, there are stop signs, it is a four-way stop, but the line markings were not visible and the actual stop sign which was here was not visible um, to the drivers, so they would just not stop and drive really quickly through it. And the residents used this online tool that we developed uh, together with Grand Projects um, to kind of give their ideas and say what they wanted. And then we gave them alternatives to choose from, and they chose the seasonal turn. And then here is the community paint day. We're installing it. Um, this is how it looks like from, from above. So these bump outs really make the driving space or the space for cars uh, much less. So they have to slow down in order to make the turns or, or go through. Um, the mayor, Brandon Scott, came to open um, the crosswalk. Uh, and then we use the major look observation tool that we developed together with the Highway Safety Office to kind of evaluate the effectiveness of this intervention. And I won't go through everything, but uh, uh, the most important finding is that we see a significant increase in cars yielding to other road users. So before the install, only six out of 24, 21 cars yielded. And then after the crosswalk, 23 out of 31 cars yielded and saw, saw the pedestrians and then stopped for them uh, so that they could cross the street. Uh, phase three, democratizing the process. So we had heard from a lot of communities that they really wanted to make traffic calming in initiatives in their areas, but the process of how to do it and how to get permission to do it was really hard to understand and navigate. So we collaborated with the uh, Department of Transportation, DOT, uh, in Baltimore City to kind of create this guide for communities to be able to do it themselves. And um, it's, the process is divided into five steps, and then it's written as a checklist. So if you go through the five steps, you should be able to kind of do, get, a, get a successful install. So, um, it kind of focuses on the, the documents you need to seek approval uh, with the city, but then also how do you make these documents? So how do you make these maps? How do you make the designs? How do you make designs to scale, et cetera? Um, and then in the spring, we had six workshops with, um, we had 44 different community organizations attending the workshops. We sent out 75 packages to 31 different zip codes throughout, both in Baltimore City, Maryland, but also uh, someone from Ecuador contacted us, Minnesota. Um, so that was great to see kind of how it grew and, and the information spread. And then and now we have five uh, community organizations that are kind of using the toolkit and then giving us feedback on how it works and what we need to improve on it, or how to make it more clear, or even more understandable. And then quickly, phase four, I'll hand back over to you. Yeah, and leading into uh, phase four, that's year four, accessibility, sustainability, and evaluation. 
And um, this year, we're really focusing on the process and making the tools widely available for everyone. We're planning out the long-term sustainability and the homes for all of these pilots we created. And we're collecting and evaluating data to really see, to evaluate the effectiveness and the impact um, from these collaborations. And uh, we're also working on statewide collaborations. We're trying to move out more further, uh, stretch out further from Baltimore City. And this is a list of all of our new partners we've added on. Um, as you can see, the list keeps growing, and you'll hear more about these people later. The Neighborhood Design Center is going to be the home of our toolkit. They're going to keep it on their website and host it and keep it updated with BDOT. So this is something that was a big win for us to make it accessible for communities. And this is a project that we're working on with NDC to help them learn the toolkit in Johnson Square. And we held a, a community uh, visioning workshop with residents to really figure out how they wanted to plan these intersections and the color schemes they wanted to match their new branding package that NDC designed. And we created a toolbox that will be available at the Stational Tool Library where neighborhoods and communities can rent out the tools needed to install the uh, traffic calming mechanisms or paint uh, installations um, while using the toolkit. And it's a new addition that we're working on that's going to be added into the toolkit is a DIY traffic camera that we've been working on at Washington College. And um, this is going to give communities the opportunity to really gauge and test their intersections to see if cars are um, responding to the new mechanisms and to really help gauge speeds. And to wrap it up, um, our last intervention that was pretty much a wrapping on from last year was the underline which is a lighting uh, exploration that's going to be installed into the I-83 underpass on North Avenue and in hopes of visually enhancing that space and making it feel safer while also uh, lighting up pedestrians and, and making them more visible to cars. And this is the idea of what's what that space could look like. That's a mural that was done in, 2005, in 2010 that was a social justice mural. And we're gonna have it restored with the original artists and some of the original students that helped install it. And we're gonna add some black light effects. So that mural will, be, will react to the, um, the uh, black lights and all the new lights that will be added into that intersection to really wrap up that whole North Avenue rising improvements in that area and make it a new vibrant and fun space and a safe space for um, pedestrians and all transit users. And thank you for having us. And we will move on, move it on to Kenna. One moment. Okay. Michael, can you can you um, toss me the screen one more time? Uh, Kenna. Yeah. Can I, you uh, are you have screen share? There you go. Now just go full screen. Good morning. Um, go into you, slideshow, please. Go into that? slideshow. Oh, I am. Please go into. Oh, okay. Can you uh, change your screen? Unpaused. Your monitor. Does that go to uh, change your screen under the sharing tab? There you go. Okay, not sure what I did, but it looks like it's working now. Um, well, first off, huge fan of the Made You Look campaign. Loved that presentation. I'm here to talk about the Look Alive program and campaign that we um, um, are working with. I work with Sherry Matthews Group. We um, are a full service marketing communication firm and we partner with Baltimore Metropolitan Council and um, the Maryland Department of Transportation and partners across the region to um, create and implement the Look Alive pedestrian and bicycle safety campaign. 
And basically our assignment is um, to raise awareness of the behaviors most likely to be involved in pedestrian and bicycle collisions, um, raise awareness about the uh, proper procedures around crosswalks and um, motivate people to change their behaviors to reduce the likelihood of crashes that involve a pedestrian or um, bicyclist. And when we look at the pedestrian safety landscape, there, <laughs> I've worked in traffic safety for 15 years now, and pedestrian safety and bicycle safety are the most challenging topics to talk about um, because it's complicated. There's no one point of decision moment. Click it or ticket, you get in the car, you buckle your safety belt, then you don't have to think about it again. Um, don't drink and drive, same thing. Um, there's a point of decision, but with um, pedestrian and bicycle safety, it's literally every second you're in the car or walking or on a bike. And there are multiple target groups, drivers, pedestrians, and bicyclists. There are many messages for each group. Yield to pedestrians when turning. Watch for bicyclists coming in both directions while you're making that turn. Um, slowing down. Um, stopping for pedestrians at crosswalks. Using the crosswalks. There's so many messages. And um, walkability and safety conditions vary. You might um, have um, a downtown area that's very friendly to ped pedestrians, but the infrastructure there is um, encouraging to drivers to drive slower um, and then um, we have roads that are that are more dangerous um, and where someone might have to walk half a mile to get to a crosswalk um, and so um, there's just uh, some huge challenges in in the pedestrian safety landscape and when we're, when we're looking at our audience Pedestrian and bicycle safety is not a top of mind safety issue, and that's something that we are trying to, to change. Um, distracted driving, drunk driving, and um, booze belts and distractions are kind of what people think of when they think about traffic safety, and all of those things are very important. Um, you also get to a point where there's lots of mode specific finger pointing. When people are in the car, they are mad at the pedestrians for not being where they expect them. When you're on foot, you're mad at the drivers for uh, not not slowing down and um, and not giving you space. And so um, people often say oh, it's the other guy, <laughs> um, but most people admit to unsafe behavior at some point and have excuses for that. When I'm in a hurry, um, when I'm not paying attention, that sort of thing. So what we really want to do is um, show something unexpected that captures people's attention and is memorable um, and motivating to change behaviors. And so um, we've worked with an advisory group for several years and came up with the um, Look Alive campaign. Um, Michael, if you wouldn't mind rolling the um, TV spot, which is our um, sort of keystone um, piece of the campaign. Great, thank you. Um, so that Signal Woman spot introduces our heroine, <laughs> Signal Woman, who um, gives safety reminders to uh, people walking, biking, and behind the wheel. And um, that's just an introductory piece. We have um, so many more components um, with messaging to all road users. 
Um, and uh, it's definitely a concept that can be built upon with, with new message. We talked about there's so many messages and things to learn when it comes to um, pedestrian and bicycle safety. So um, these are just some of the outdoor ads that we have that um, have been on billboards, they've been on buses, um, and online um, kiosks. We've used uh, partners to, to get them up as, as much as we can. So looking at the campaign and at a glance, we have paid media, um, um, on the ground outreach, and we also do media tours and PR to get um, news attention. Um, and law enforcement activations with police department partners um, to raise awareness of the, the laws around the crosswalks and um, that law enforcement's um, working on stepping up enforcement. And then we also have signal women on social media. Um, these are our ads on MTA buses, Bus routes, we, when we're planning media, we try to um, look at where crashes are most likely to happen and exposure on bus routes is high. You have uh, drivers interacting with people walking and biking, getting on and off buses. And so when you, when you look at the GIS data, every pedestrian safety campaign we've worked on, the bus routes correlate with um, with crashes because there's just a high exposure rate for pedestrians. So we make sure that we put um, ads. We like the bus tails, they're right in the face of the drivers and um, uh, then interiors as well for that pedestrian messaging. Um, we also put the TV spot on gas station TV, um, which is when the, the captive driver audience, when the the gas pump handle is lifted, you start pumping up, signal woman will be there to tell you what you need to know. Um, and we did that at um, over 100 gas station locations throughout the Baltimore region. Um, and we also had uh, the video on over the top connected TV um, and online as well. We um, launched some signal woman on social media channels on both Twitter and Instagram to provide sustained year round virtual outreach. This is especially important during the pandemic when some of our in-person outreach um, was, was not as possible. Um, and we were able to balance signal woman's like fun and humorous side with safety messages. And it really allows for a plethora of safety messages in all of our partner, um, features with events and, and other things. And we have ongoing content series, which, um, solve the signals throwback Thursday featuring pop culture, um, things that, people are used to engaging with and sharing online, um, puzzles and challenges, um, something a little bit different to, to make people actually stop and be like, what is that? Oh, that's funny, um, and, and might be more likely to share. So we have all of these different ways of getting um, a variety of messages out there. Um, and she's been she's been online for about a year. <laughs> You're welcome to give her a follow. Um, and just in the last year, we've gotten um, 2,300 followers, but 13.7 million impressions and over 207,000 quality engagements, whether that's likes or shares or comments, um, clicks. Um, so we're we're pleased with how that's going and are and are proud of those results. Um, we've enlisted the help of some friends of Signal Woman, socially distanced during the pandemic, Signal People, um, with targeted outreach events in Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel, and Howard Counties as well. And um, we have them in their uh, white outfits mimicking the pedestrian signal and wearing um, backpack billboards or what we call walking billboards um, during the fall when, when it's getting a little dark um, we have illuminated backpack billboards and then the traditional sort of uh, static static billboards and it's just another channel they we've we work with our partners to target specific intersections that might need a little bit more attention or messaging um, and have had um, I think about 12 of those events in the last year 
and um, uh, during the pandemic, they're more visual aids. They aren't engaging with people or breathing on anyone. <laughs> we have our, our masks up um, um, as well. So mainly the driver um, visual. And we also um, pitch that out as part of um, our PR efforts. So we work with our um, BMC partners, MDOT partners, and police partners um, along with our signal people, anything that we can pitch the media that to tell our story, um, to, to get even more free coverage of the campaign and get our safety messages out there. Um, so if we have a, a signal person event or an enforcement activation, um, we invite the, the media out to see it. Sometimes they come, sometimes they don't, but within the last um, two years, we've gotten nearly 60 news stories um, and estimated publicity value at about um, three million. Um, my favorite, um, uh, of course, is uh, is Bala doing doing his thing um, um, on um, on interviews. So um, those are just some of the results that we've had over the last couple of years. We're excited to um, continue, hopefully, working with the Baltimore Metropolitan Council and. Um, and MDOT to, to give Signal Woman even, even more acclaim and, and, and fame and get those, those safety messages out there. Um, so that's it for me. I'll turn it back over to Michael. Great, thank you, Kenna. And as we uh, kind of reset here, we'll ask our presenters to turn on their cameras. And I'll just note for the audience that we actually had a fire drill in our building during the webinar, so we had to go outside and run this from a hot spot for a while, but we're back. So I'm glad to be back in time for the questions. And thanks to everybody for being on here. Okay, uh, I guess the uh, uh, first question, I'll just start from the, the bottom of the queue since um, Kenny, you were just talking about this. Um, a question from Chloe Moore is, uh, why did you decide to have Signal Woman target pedestrians as well as drivers? Um, so that was that was part of the assignment. Um, we've we've looked at crash data and about um, uh, depending on where where your um, where you're looking at within the region, um, it's about half and half for uh, we don't like to say at fault, but um, we um, we we looked at the crash data at the the different behaviors that that lead to crashes to inform that and also um i mean i i think that drivers often that they're the one that that are driving sort of the deadly the deadly weapon if you will but the um we got to give people the information to protect them themselves as well and so um that um if, if we can give someone a, a tip on um, how to keep themselves safer, maybe that could could be the difference in in um, their life. Great, thank you. Uh, next question here uh, says, um, the art in the right of way is very intriguing. In my community, I see a lot of homeowners put signs along the road saying something like, this is a neighborhood, not a drag strip, please slow down. Uh, this pro proliferate proliferation of signs along the road gets the message out, but they're very distracting and unsightly. What would you suggest to people outside of Baltimore City concerned about traffic calming and wanting to get their local public works or transportation engineers informed about art and the right of way and being more receptive to this approach? We're happy to come and talk, but then um, I think that's part of the focus for this year. Try to get statewide collaborations because we're we're very aware that Baltimore City is one of the only counties that actually allow it, and I think it's because of the street design that it, in suburbia is more like biggest biggest streets, arterial roads, higher tra higher traffic. But um, I think you should just try reach out to them and i think most counties have have a so this program is under the community programs in baltimore city dot like reach out to the community programs go to the website and see if they have one and then try do it but um yeah we're and i think the more people that request it the more there will be 
Yeah, and try to request a traffic study. You know, they'll try to tell you what mechanisms can go there. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question here from Owen Bailey says, uh, how was the process for getting the city of Baltimore to approve the use of the Made You Look toolkit? Can you talk a bit about that? So the, the process existed way before us and way before the Made You Look initiative. But um, the problem was that it was hard to, to navigate it. So before, before the toolkit, there was mainly one person, and that was Graham, Graham Projects, Graham Corell Allen, who had managed to kind of navigate the whole permitting process with DOT. So it wasn't DOT giving us permission. It was very much a collaboration with the community program department in how can we make the process that already exists more understandable and more easily accessible. Okay, thank you. I guess another question for the two of you is uh, from Scott Duncanson, who's asking, the pavement markings are colorful, but obviously not standard. So how difficult was it working with the COB and or MDOT to get these colorful pavement markings accepted for implementation? <laughs> Custom colors. Um, we can't use any official DOT colors, any safety colors. So all of these colors are pretty much um, custom custom made and the city they approve all the designs before we they come in and install them and all of the paint that we use is already on a city dot list of approved paints that can go down okay and i guess a related question here regarding the campaign did you run into any pushback from state or local transportation organizations about painting the streets there's a lot of there's a lot of internal so even though Baltimore City Department of Transportation has this program, there's a lot of kind of disagreements about how effective this is and how how if it's creating safer streets or distracting drivers more. So that's I think that's why we've been evaluating and focusing on evaluating to kind of be part of that conversation that and and try to show whether the, these kind of interventions work or not. But Yes, so internally in DOT or internally amongst the traffic engineering community, I guess it's it's kind of split split camps. And then, but then I think using the evaluation tools, like the observation tool and the speed camera that we would we will use to test kind of before and after installed and see the effectiveness of this of it is like us wanting to contribute to that debate and be part of that. Okay, thank you, Billy. Here's a question for Carrie from Joe Kelly, who's asking, how was how long was the path for Story Path? So the path changes, the length of the path changes depending on the length of the book. Um, and our books are anywhere between 14 and 22 signs. So usually what I do is I try to take about 10 big steps in between, um, keeping in mind that our Books are developmentally appropriate for probably around age five, five to eight, five to ten. Um, so we're we're not making it cover a huge distance. We're acknowledging the fact that the folks who are using it have shorter legs. <laughs> so um, it doesn't cover a huge uh, space amount of length of path. Um, but yeah, it's it's about ten steps in between the signs, and our largest one um, is about twenty two pages. Okay, thanks, Gary. Another question for you is, uh, did you need to check uh, co on copyright or licensing issues to use the books for Story Path? That's a great question. We dove into this quite a bit because we were really unsure. Um, so part of the path that we went through was that this program is existing and it's something that has been used before. And so there were kind of two key things that we paid attention to. The first is that um, it's not used in connection with any paid event. So um, it's free for everyone to use and it's not something we're making money off of. So that's kind of the first part. The second part is we always pay for a brand new book um, to put on the signs. So um, we are not, you know, we're not like pulling pictures offline or anything like that. Like we're paying the authors for their book that we actually then um, break down and use for the signs. And you do have to get two books. So, because most pages 
print front and back. So in order to have the signs, have all the pages, you have to get two copies of each book. Um, and so we felt comfortable with that given um, what we had read from the originator of the story walk. There's some information on their website about how to make sure you're not violating copyright issues. Um, but yeah, those were, that was definitely a concern. And those were kind of two of the things that we made sure to do to stay and not run into any issues with that. Yeah, that's good information to share for folks thinking about setting this up. Um, so just remind folks that you can continue to submit questions uh, through the questions tab. We have a few more. Uh, we could use a few more if we uh, finish early with the questions. We may end a little early today. Um, and given all of our logistical challenges today, I think we'd be okay with that. Um, and I'll note, we didn't do a poll uh, starting out asking where people were from, but I know we have some people outside of Maryland and welcome to everybody today who's not just here, but also throughout the country and pro probably internationally as well. So with that in mind, the next uh, comment is from Phyllis DiDiano, who is in Pittsburgh, who says, uh, thank you for the Walktober series streamed for all to access. I'm enjoying all the speakers. Uh, Carrie's intro hit the nail on the head with the extension office referral because they provide great opportunities that may be an, an inadvertently missed. I wanna give out a shout out to the Penn State extension office. They were as wonderful as you had said and opened up a range of resources and assistance to our community organization that we had never even imagined doing. So it sounds like this this work is is happening elsewhere. That's awesome. I'm so glad you're connected with your extension office. We love the Penn State folks. Um, we work together across different state groups all the time. So yeah, that's fantastic. Great. And I think this is another question outside of Maryland. Uh, and that is from Jay Munn who's saying, are there any initiatives to construct more physically separated bike lanes? Calgary has a great lower cost model. if anybody is able to take that one on or wants to. So we haven't focused on building the bike lanes per se because our, all our interventions have been low cost and how can communities do it themselves? And, but um, right now with the underlying initiative, uh, we're working closely with uh, the bike planner at DOT, but also North Avenue Rising to connect the bike lanes um, that are surrounding North Avenue to, to the North Avenue, like right at that intersection, there's some missing paths. So we're working, like we're more advocating for it, but um, I haven't seen the Calgary one. I'll have a look after. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is from Chloe Moore, who's asking, how were each of these initiatives funded? And Maybe we can start, whoever wants to start, but maybe Carrie, do you um, want to also, talk? Go ahead, go ahead, Kenna. I was just gonna say the um, the Baltimore Metropolitan Council's um, campaign is funded through the Maryland Highway Safety Office through their grant um, process, which um, I think stems all the way up to NHTSA, um, the National Highway Safety um, Administration to um, those federal dollars trickle down through the Maryland Highway Safety Office and the um, Baltimore Metropolitan Council applied for the grant to get funding for that. Yeah, we are under the same same grant process and same from the Highway Safety Office. So it's, you can apply for grants for education initiatives or outreach. So education, outreach and engagement initiatives around pedestrian and bike safety. So there's several grantees every year. And we've been collaborating with the Baltimore Metropolitan Council a lot because we're both grantees under the same grant. So then my process is a little bit different. <laughs> um, so Live Well Frederick, they, most of their funding comes from Frederick Health. And I'm not 100% sure if those are Community Reinvestment Act or um, uh, possibly the Affordable Care Act, but there there is a policy that says that um, hospitals especially have to spend a certain amount of money um, doing prevention and engagement and awareness building in communities. So Live Well Frederick really came out of um, those dollars that Frederick Health had available. And so what they were hoping to do was take more of a coalition approach so that they could um, kind of 
increase their reach in the community through that um, portal kind of. So it's Frederick Health funding that goes through Live Well Frederick. Um, I didn't necessarily know that when I got involved with Live Well Frederick. I just thought they might be excited about it and thought that we could potentially have more success finding funding if we had more partners that were engaged on this. Um, so when I reached out to them originally, it was just about them being as a, a partner. And then in conversations with them, they said, well, we'll reach back up to Frederick Health and see if our Live Well Frederick budget can be used to cover these materials, um, provided that we're getting the support from these other organizations in terms of you know, location and resources and myself doing the driving and going to put the signs up and that kind of thing. Um, and they were cool with it. So <laughs> my process was much less formal and more so just kind of a lucky thing that I asked the right folks and they happened to have some funding that, that could be used for it. <laughs> Great, thanks, Gary. I guess another question for you is, uh, have you considered books for adults, say graphic novels? I have seen, so I mentioned a little bit that there are lots of different organizations that have implemented these sorts of programs. And I have seen some longer trails that have used um, graphic novels, especially like, you know, the kind of teenage age range. I will say that I have seen older kids using the path older than I thought would find it interesting. Um, so it is something that we have talked about because we kind of, when we were planning it, thought, well, this is really only something that younger kids are going to be interested in. Older kids are going to be like, why would I walk along a path and, and read this book? Um, and that turned out not to be the case. The, the older kids have been surprisingly engaged. So yeah, it's something we're considering. Um, and you know, we kind of have to think about how we would do that. It would be a lot more materials because those books are significantly longer. Um, but I think it would be really cool. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, next question here is for Kenna from Matt Grady, who's asking, how are you measuring the success of the Signal Woman campaign? Um, we have several ways to um, to measure the success of the campaign. Um, uh, one way is um, a survey, an online survey for awareness um, that um, measures recall um, in the general public. Um, we also measure our success by how many how many news stories we get, um, the publicity value, and then our metrics online. Um, uh, we really use it, it, something called involvement, so like active engagements that are are people watching the video all the way through, sharing, commenting, um, liking. But then we also have um, an annual survey that measures awareness as well. And any of our events, um, we've done um, pre-pandemic, we had a virtual reality um, uh, car that, that um, taught people how to where they needed to be looking for uh, pedestrians and bicyclists and we'd have a survey at at those type of events for people to to share what they had learned as well great thank you um, next question here's for Fieldy and Quinton um, could you please tell us more about the maintenance of pavement markings associated with the major look program more specifically the cost and schedule Uh, sure, I'll touch on some of that. Um, with all of the installations, they have to be insured uh, with the city for two years after installation. So um, that's given the rights over to the city afterwards. And um, the neighborhoods are responsible for some of the low cost maintenance. And But really, most of the pavement markings being that they're not going on the road necessarily where cars are driving. They don't actually need that much upkeep. You know, it's really just foot foot traffic. Um, we haven't done that many uh, installations where cars are driving on them so much where it's rubbing them in ways where you might want to clean them or something like that because the paint that we use has a non-slip additive in it. So it's pretty much uh, adding an extra protection coat to the, to the surface that we put it on. So um, really the only maintenance that, that's really required is the flex post because if they're doing their job, people are gonna hit them. <laughs> so um, you're gonna probably replace one or two or three. So with our agreement that, that the city gives us, um, 
this is really what they have set up for everyone is uh if you buy the flex post you you they're pretty much you're pretty much replacing their stock so they'll they'll install them for free and they they usually advise you to get like four or five extra just to take care of that and they they come install them so if they break you just put in a 311 request and they'll come fix it because we're not painting in the roadway as Clinton said um we're 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 painting inside the the lines where the bump outs or yeah the flex posts are so we we're using we're able to use like not high traffic grade paint we're using something that's called con concrete stain um and it's relatively cheap so one one intersection with four bump outs we just bought paint the other week for the Johnson Square installation is about two thousand dollars and then so but uh, I think the the biggest cost of doing those kind of interventions is not necessarily buying the paint it's um the the hours that goes into it so there's a lot of labor that goes into doing the or whether it's a community organization or someone doing it but doing the community engagement or the design work making the signs and then also uh, creating and submitting the documents like the planning work before is the major cost in this project okay thank you our next question here is for carrie from julianne woods who says how does story path work during winter months is there any extra protection that you have to use to keep them intact and what about the sun watch, washing out the print pages? And Julie notes that she's from Colorado. So I've seen some really creative ways that people have used story walks or story paths through the winter. Personally, we store ours through the winter. So from um, we'll probably take ours down here in the next two weeks and we'll store it up until about March. And then in April, it'll go back out. So um, usually we keep it inside. We don't, we don't display it during the winter. What I have seen though are that some places will um, do like a downtown storefront approach where if you're like walking down the street in uh, a downtown area, if they have storefront window displays, then they will display a page within that window at a mall. Um, so it looks like most places that I'm familiar with move them inside as it gets colder if they have the ability to do that. Um, Personally, since we use, mostly use ours in the parks, once it gets cold enough, we just take it inside and we don't display it anymore until the spring. Um, and then as far as the fading goes, we have done pretty well with that so far. The only thing that we've noticed is that if the page is, is mainly white, like the background of it is mainly white, then um, after maybe two or three summers that it's been out, you start to be able to see through the page. Um, but like uh, Giraffes Can't Dance is one I think that I mentioned. Um, I Will Never Not Ever Eat a Tomato. Most of those are full color backgrounds. And so we don't see a lot of issues with fading. They've held up really, really well over time. So my suggestion would be the more color the page has, the better it holds up to the um, sun over time. Thank you. Um, next question here is from our colleague uh, Wally Lippincott. I have a question about a traffic slowing device that was put on a busy street by my house. The island is concrete and does not visually stand out. Is there some reference I can use to advise my county traffic folks that it should have color? If you look at uh, Graham Project, or or so in Baltimore City, twenty so Margaret Brent, Margaret Brent Elementary School in Baltimore City, twenty sixth Street, um, they have painted concrete bump outs. So, um, but also Graham Project, it was him that, or we did it together with him, and it's on his website. I can write it in the chat too. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we can definitely share that as well. Quentin, were you going to add anything? You're still you're still muted. Okay. Uh, next question here is from Ed Hamlin, who says, uh, 
have you considered raised walkways that act like speed bumps, albeit with more gradual slopes and with due regard for surface drainage? Could you repeat quickly? Sure. Have you considered raised walkways that act like speed bumps, albeit with more gradual slopes and with due regard for surface drainage? Hmm. I don't believe I'm familiar, but um, I know around the elementary school that that we did a um, a new traffic direction around. They have high, like really high, wide raised stops, but uh, like traffic bumps. But I'm not so sure about the raised crosswalks. It may, it might not have came up because it. It may have been such a high a high fidelity installation that it didn't cross uh, research. Okay, I will ask a couple more here before we wrap. Um, are there organizations in the community that you would suggest reaching out to promote safe walking opportunities? And I guess that's a general question for everyone. If you have suggestions. Safe. Mm -hmm. Safe routes to school. Can I can you talk about safe routes to school? Yeah, safe routes to school. Uh, yeah, repeat the question. One. The question is about uh, what types of community organizations would uh, you suggest reaching out to um, to support these types of programs? I guess kind of be partners in this. Um, the local county DOT is who we worked with in Montgomery County. Um, we have uh, lots of partners, the health department um, even um, uh, has vested in interest in, in pedestrian, um, pedestrian safety um, schools um, specifically um, and um, neighborhood associations, um, even like Department of uh, Public Works. <laughs> Everyone, um, this is an issue that affects so many, um, so many organizations. Yeah, I was also typing. So, for us, we work with community organizations, and then we have partners like so funding partners. For example, so the Central Baltimore Partnership, which is a development corporation, is our funding partner, but also close collaborators. But then um, I was writing in the in the chat that uh, so if you if you I'll send the link to where to find our toolkit and there we have a list of resources um, and kind of also financial re like where to apply for grants and those organizations is a good starting point for for engaging and I think this city for us it's been like neighborhood level but then. Um, yeah, development corporations, community organizations, but then funding partners are national in initiatives like the Bloomberg, Bloomberg Asphalt Art Initiative and uh, AARP Livable Communities. These are you know, these are our funding partners that have initiatives and have large networks and go into those um, resources and see uh, what they suggest kind of in local areas or within each county. And um, we've collaborated with uh, Central Baltimore Partnership on uh, an art walk recently. Um, that's what highlighting a lot of the uh, the landmarks around uh, Station North. And um, but uh, we also work a lot with uh, bike safety also. So we collaborate with a lot of our events uh, with like Bike More and Black People Ride Bikes and um, Baltimore Youth Kinetic Energy. That's like a younger bike advocate group. So uh, we ours is very very community based, um, but we try to keep it keep it real local and hands on. Great, thank you. I'm going to ask two more, and then we'll end with a comment. Um, and this one's from Josh DeBrune, who's asking, I guess Philly and Quinton, did you get any feedback from people low vision about painting up of the sidewalk? Some people with low vision might find the pavement painting difficult to navigate. Do the do the perception of dark spots being holes or bumps? 
We, we've had that question and comment before, and the answer is no, but that's part of what we want to try to do this year. So also kind of getting input from communities of low vision, but also hearing um, just to kind of adapt and see what we should include in the toolkit about that. So yes, we're on it, but no, we don't have an answer. Yeah, and all of our installations, um, they're all ADA compliant. So we, we try to make sure that we're making it safe for everyone. Great, thank you. <clears throat> and then I guess the question for Carrie is, has Storybook been done on city streets or only within parks? And would it make sense to do the book walks on say, for example, safe routes to school routes? Yeah, I, I have seen it implemented in tons of different ways. Um, personally in Frederick County, we did it in the parks, um, but I, I would imagine that in a city, you, you'd have to get a little bit more creative. So our signs are actually like uh, hammered into the soil. So they have kind of like metal stakes and we pound them into the ground. Um, so it would, I think, be a little bit more difficult in the city to come up with something that is not going to blow over in the wind or anything like that. Um, it's going to be somewhere you can put it that's not in the way. <laughs> There's just, you know, more limited space compared to, you know, big county park. But uh, like I said, I have seen initiatives where people do it um, in windows attached to like um, people's stoops. Sometimes people have like a, um, a railing or something that they could kind of mount it to the front. And I think having it along a walking path to a school would be great. It's we've seen it as a great way. I, I didn't really mention this. I think it was on one of the slides, but we've partnered with Frederick County Public Schools as um, one of their kind of year end fun activities is that we come set some of these up at the schools and the kids get a specific time slot in the day to walk through and read the book as a class. And um, so the schools have been very interested in it. It's something that they have really enjoyed having available. So I think um, it would be really great thing to look into. It's just not how we particularly did it. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so I'm going to close with a comment here uh, from Lynn Margaret Brown, who speaks a little bit to the reach of, of today's webinar and all of the ones that we've done this month. So I think it's a good way to kind of end our webinar uh, today and this month. And she says that she's uh, tuning in from Berlin, Germany, working online but representing New York City and Long Island. Uh, we are a community bike and pedestrian safety nonprofit organization in Westbury, New York. I am working on trying to collaborate and organize some kind of community program reflecting these issues in both New York and Berlin and taking a look at how both places deal with these issues. Our nonprofit collaborates with many other organizations that deal with health and community safety. We also conduct health and safety walks on Long Island. This is all great information and thank you so much. All of this information has been truly helpful. So even though we're very local in terms of the projects that we've been talking about, I think they apply in many places. And so I think that just speaks to uh, the great work that you've been doing, everybody, and then also all of the, uh, the projects and programs and approaches that we have been um, highlighting all month. So I think that's a great way to, to kind of conclude not only today, but the whole uh, Walktober walk in our series. So with that, I'm gonna thank all of our presenters and conclude this webinar today. Great partners and creative approaches for promoting safe walk opportunities. And it, like I said, also concludes our Walktober walk in our series. Thank you for joining us today and throughout the month. I would like to offer a great big thank you to our speakers for a great presentation, to everyone who attended today, and to Francine Waters and Brittany Brothers of MDOT who pulled this series together, as well as to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru who managed the technical aspects of the program today. And he truly is a guru because we were able to keep this going despite having to leave the building for a fire drill. Um, so that just speaks to his capacities to continue to do all this programming. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted online and our participation, our participants today will receive an email with the link. Please visit smartgrowth.org and m.maryland.gov forward slash Walktober to review all of the Walktober programming that has taken place this month. You can also view the catalog of Walktober walk in ours this year and last at the Smart Growth Online page on YouTube. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback 
so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And finally, visit smartgrowth.org for more information about our upcoming webinars. And with that, I wish everyone a great day.